So let me tell you about my next Beatle article. Okay. Because it's, it's timely. Okay. December 8th will be the 40th anniversary since the assassination. I know. It's a, mi it's a milestone. Okay. Yes. And to Beatle fans in the Beatle world, it's, 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 it's a tough one. It, it, it's tough. And um, uh, the night that he was killed, um, to be, uh, you'll find this rather kind of ironic. You know, I was married to Mark's sister. Mark Mendoza's sister was my first mm -hmm. wife. The night of our first date was the night that he was killed. Wow. So Jody and I had had dinner in New York City. And then she was on her way back to Long Island. I came home, I turned on the radio. and Oh my God, Lennon murdered. And I run down to the Dakota, which is only 10 minutes from my house. Yeah. And stood outside for uh, the whole night. I was numb. I was just, as everybody was. I'm not saying it was me. It was just, we're all numb, right? I'm numb. So I was sitting there watching this. And like, oh my God. It's just, so with the 40th anniversary coming up, and because I write a Beatle column for, for uh, Goldmine, I said to my editor, I want to acknowledge the date but not do a depressing story about Lennon's murder because I don't want to mention that scum who killed him. Right. I don't, really don't want to mention his name. I don't want to right. dignify gotcha. it. So I just said, but I want to talk about the vibe. And, and the other thing is that, uh, as you know, I walk every day, I walk in Central Park. And I always walk by Strawberry Fields. It's part of my pathway. So people come up to me, seriously. I should have a t-shirt that just answers the two questions that everybody asks me. One, where's the Metropolitan Museum of Art? And two, where's Strawberry Fields? I should just have it on a shirt. Arrow this way, arrow this way, don't ask. Just follow the t-shirt and leave me the hell alone. But usually they go take me to Strawberry Fields. And it's on my way. So I walk them to Strawberry Fields and there's always a guy playing guitar. Have you been to Strawberry Fields a couple of times? Uh, yeah. In fact, uh, you know, you talk about the 40th anniversary. I'm going to be going into Manhattan to film some stuff um, okay. specifically around that. But yeah. So there's always somebody playing Beatles songs. So I started thinking to myself, who does that? Like what, who, who organized Like I wanted to know. So I found the guy who actually organizes it and I interviewed him for Goldmine. So I'm doing a story called Strawberry Fields Forever and Ever and Ever and Ever. And it's about the singing minstrels of Strawberry wow. Fields. Because it's a positive story, you know, and I wanted to do that. So that's an example. But I will tell you um, the greatest, John, the greatest Beatles story I ever wrote for the magazine, if I may indulge you Absolutely. in this. Um, this, is, this, this story, Joe, um, gives me chills. Every time I tell it, I don't know if I even... Did I even tell you the story about the cable guy that came to my house? Did I tell you the story? Okay. No. Okay. So in my living room, I have a eight foot long, double black and white framed, two pictures of the Beatles taken at the Ed Sullivan show, one on stage, one backstage by some photographer who then blew these beautiful pictures up and presented it to Capitol Records. And the president of Capitol put it up in his, in his office. So it's like, yeah. that was it. And um, when my wife worked at EMI, there was a shuffling of something happened and moved stuff around. And she said to her boss, boy, if I could ever get that. So we got it. So it's sitting in our living room. It's beautiful. It's sitting in our living room. So now, this is eight years ago because I was 60 years old. So eight years ago, I called Time Warner and I'm complaining that my cable is crapping out. Like they all crap out. Yeah. And they keep sending 25-year-old kids to fix it, and they never fix it, right? So I tell them, I don't want a 25-year-old idiot. I want a senior manager. So lo and behold, guy comes to my house. He's an he's a older African-American gentleman, you know, he's balding, gray hair. But you can tell he's a senior, senior guy, right? He comes in, he goes, what's the problem? I said, my cable it never gets fixed again. And he goes, all oh, these young people are idiots. I'll fix it for you. So he walks in the living room, Joe. He sees the Beatle picture. On the floor. And this is what he says. He goes, that John Lennon cat. I was there the day he arrived. I was there the day he left. So I'm not paying much attention to that line. I was there the day he arrived. I was there the day he left. So I, I stop. I go, excuse me. Can you, what did you just say? He said that John Lennon cat. I was there the day he arrived. I was there the day he left. What, what does that mean? He says, well, he goes, how old are you? I said, I'm 60. I was, I was, he goes, well, so am I. He goes, where'd you, where you born? I said, New York City. He goes, I was born in Queens. He said, I was born across the street from Idlewild Airport, which used to JFK, JFK before. So he said, my school used to do fundraising at the airport. So we said on the day the Beatles came, which was, and he knew the date, he said February 7th, 1964, my class was at Kennedy Airport selling cookies or candy or something. 
And he goes, next thing you know, girls are screaming, police are everywhere. And these four guys in mop tops walk by. And I come home and I look at the news. I go, mom, mom, I was out. They walked right by me. I saw the Beatles. I go, well, that, that's impressive. He goes, yeah, man, except that on December 8th, 1980, I was working for um, Western Union. I was delivering telegrams to Dakota. And I just finished dropping off a telegram and I heard the gunshot. He goes, so I was there the day he left. And I went, oh my God. You may be the only human being on the planet who could say that. Yeah. And those are the kind of stories, human interest stories, that you look for when you write these columns. Because you don't want to write the same old, right. same old story about the Beatles. As you know, it's always coming up with new perspectives. So I love my podcast is going to be the things I find that I'm passionate about. You know, it really is guitar collecting. Fortunately, Bruce won't be a topic necessarily of the conversation. Well, I'm always available to be a guest on your show. <laughs> yeah, and, and you can talk about everything that makes you happy, which is fine by me, you know. So everyone knows Joe and I have this thing back and forth. I'm not the biggest Bruce fan. However, I respect, I, you have to respect. It comes out of the bar circuit that we did. But I'm just not a big fan. But you, on the other hand, come on. Well, biggest was fan. Springsteen is my Beatles. Okay. You know, because I'm I'm younger than I'm younger than it's not that I don't appreciate what the Beatles did, but it's just that Springsteen is my Beatles. He was there. He wrote about the stuff that was more right there. That's the stuff in my formative years. And my rock education came from him. You know, we talk all the time. Here's something that a lot of people don't necessarily know about you. The very first show that you ever came and sat in with us. The first thing, the first thing you said to me, because we were on stage when you came in, we took a break and then you got up with us again and you were like, oh, you played Lou Reed. I like that. I'm like, we got more Lou Reed. And then you were like, do you any Chuck Berry? I'm like, it'll be easier for me to tell you what Chuck Berry songs we don't do than to list the ones we do. And then another time you were just like, you know what band I always wanted to cover? And I'm like, no, who? And you were like, rock pile. And I'm like, okay. So your musical taste is a lot wider than I think oh, a lot of people realize. Well, I was, a grateful, I was a grateful dead freak. Most people are shocked. Most people are totally shocked to think that I was a grateful dead freak. I take pride in making people feel sick about how much of a grateful dead freak I was because I saw them 27 times and I saw them with pig pen 27 wow. times. I saw them between 69 and 72, 27 times. Now it's true that the first 26 times I saw them on acid and it was the greatest thing I'd ever seen. And the 27th time I saw them straight and I said, what the hell was I thinking? But, which also happens to be a Grateful Dead joke. But the thing is, I just reviewed the 50th anniversary of Working Man's Dead for a rock magazine. Um, I, I, Jerry Garcia gave me a tab of acid at the film one. It doesn't get much more official than that. So I saw the Grateful Dead as an opening band. Think about that for a second. What does the dead do for an opening band? You know what they do? They tune up and say goodnight. That's what they do. <laughs> That's what they do. So I saw the dead open for Janis Joplin. I saw the dead open for uh, Country Joe and the Fish. And I met Bob Weir several years ago. And I told him, I said, I have to tell you, I saw you guys open. I said, my recollection is you tuned up and you went home. And he went, that's about right. That's what he said to me. No, the first time I saw him, they played St. Stephen. They tuned up, played St. Stephen, said goodnight. And the second time they tuned up and played China Cat Sunflower and said goodnight. And then the second time I saw them, when they did that, Country Joe said, Country Joe came out and said, you know, you people in New York haven't seen the dead. You should see them. So I'm going to let them close tomorrow night. So the next night they closed them. Yeah. They played till four o'clock in the morning and the doors opened up and the sun came out and they're like, ah, and I became an ultra grateful deadhead. So my, my musical tastes are extremely, extremely varied. You know, my father, on the other hand, you know, hated rock music. And he used to tell me that it all sucked, that everything after 1945 sucked. Like he goes, he just used to say, it's all baby, baby, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it was just really easy. He dismissed hundreds of thousands of great artists. <laughs> just... <laughs> Bingo. So my daughter, you got kids. Stepkids, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. How old? I didn't have to worry about I came in when they were already teens, so. Oh, you came in later. So my daughter comes to me one day, eight years old. Daddy, I want you to listen. She brings in a Britney Spears CD. 
Okay. And she plays, of all songs on the CD, she plays Satisfaction. So, you know, after I stopped throwing up, I look at her and I go, well, this is a teachable moment, right? Now it's a teachable moment. Now it's time that her father teaches her about real, the real deal. So I say, sweetheart, you need to know that this song originally by the Rolling Stones is considered among critics to be the greatest single ever done. Hmm. And without much hype, one of the greatest radio singles ever. So I play her the Rolling Stones version of the song. I sit back, I'm waiting for some great line. She goes, that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm thinking, if I kill her now, there's a good chance that a jury of my peers will find me innocent like justifiable infanticide. Well, of course she killed her. She likes Britney Spears more than the Rolling Stones. Innocent. The father did it under duress. Temporary insanity. So at that point, I had to make a decision, which was shut your mouth and let them like what they like, because otherwise you sound like you're dead. So I really kind of just... And then she said something to me, which kind of actually really kicked my ass. So she was 17 or 18 she wanted me to go see a friend's band downtown so because i'm her dad expecting the worst and it always sucks these bands basically make lou reed sound like luciano Pavarotti, like they're just awful you know so i go see this band and they're, they're awful and i look at her and i go sweetheart i said you love t-rex you love bowie you love the queen you love but you know what great is why do you think that's good and you know what she said she said something that blew my mind she said, because they're mine, Dad. meaning it's her friends. And I'm thinking to myself, back when I got my first band together when I was 13, the Beatles were contemporary, right? They're all out right. there. Beatles, I mean, they're all there. My band's got to suck. I mean, I'm sure they sucked, but we had our local kids love the band because it was us right. trying, to, trying to be somebody. So I shut my mouth again and I said, you know. Now, the worst demo I ever got was from a, a nephew. And it was so bad that it made Yoko sound like Dolly Parton. I mean, this stuff was freaking <laughs> awful. It made Neil Young sound like Jimi Hendrix, which is next to impossible. Uh, uh, oh, so I get this demo and it's horrible. And I call his mother up. I've never done this in my life. I call the mother up. I usually always say the same thing. Keep working, keep me informed. Let me know how you're doing, you know, typical, Blah, blah, blah. You told me. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> exactly what I told you. And so uh, I call up and go, what is he majoring in college? He goes, well, a podiatry. I said, that's what he should be doing. His band is the worst band I have ever. I should have known by the name of the band how bad the band was going to be because the name was on the cassette and the name was Between Dawn and Nothingness. And that should have told me right there <laughs> that this was a bad idea. So, uh, and that, and Joe, how often do you get asked your opinion on my kid's oh, band? Constantly. All constantly. the time, right? I, what, do I you do, say? what do you say? I do my best not to, ha not to even listen. Okay. <laughs> on occasion, you have to though, right? On occasion, on, on occasion you have to people and, and then it's like, and then you just gauge, to me, it's like you gauge the situation, like how serious are they, you know? Yeah. You know, like, are they going? Are they going to quit their job tomorrow and try and make this happen, or is it just something they're doing for fun? Is it something they're doing? Here's what for it fun? kills me. Here's what kills me. This is my son's band. No, you don't understand. They're really good. No, 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 no. You don't understand. No, he really. They're really like you know Jimi Hendrix. You know, they're really amazing. And I go, oh, cool. Like, okay, okay, fine. And it's like, Ugh. but I'm sure we sucked. I'm sure the pants I was in when I was 13, 14, 15, 16 were terrible. You know? I mean, I don't have a table, Twisted Sister in 73, 74, the first version yeah. of the band. I'm sure it wasn't great. You know, I mean, in serious, seriously, so you have to kind of, I don't know, feel your way, feel your way through it. What was that? You have to feel your way through these oh, things. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? And you don't, you also don't want to, you know, some people, I am mentoring a, 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 a girl, she's no longer a girl, she's like 28, but she went to school with my daughter, high school with my daughter, mm -hmm. or junior high school. And I saw something in her that was really good and I mentored her all these years and she's, the bands are getting better and better and better and she's really good. And I won't, I don't want to manage anyone anymore officially because I don't want those phone calls at four o'clock in the morning. So I'll give you all of my advice for nothing. That way I don't owe you and you don't owe me. I'm, watch, I'm loving watching her evolve. 
because she's really evolving. Yeah. You know, and I saw it in her when I first met her. First of all, she was a concert violinist at 14. So immediately she's got musical ability. Right. Whether that transformed itself into a performer, singer, songwriter, rock star is a different story. She was serious about it. And I think the, I think the issue that we have uh, as, as uh, um, I don't know, as, as senior advisors is you have to kind of determine the passion level and the skill level of the person. And can we project for them? Right. And then the rest of the crap comes in. I mean, just because you're good doesn't mean anything. <laughs> right? It means nothing. Right. Don't even get me started on that. <laughs> yeah, it means nothing. I mean, I have to tell you, I grew up in Manhattan, hung out at the fountain in Central Park for five years. I was the worst guitar player of the whole, there was hundreds of us in there. And I was probably the worst, but I was the most determined. And that really, that really is the difference. So I believe in hard work. It sounds so cliched. But. Uh, really, it, it doesn't, you know, but, but, it, but it shows. I mean, because like, look, just the fact you got the book, Twisted Business, the business book. There's a reason why, because you realized early on, if I don't honestly get serious about this, it's not going to happen. You know, and, and that's what's led to so many of the discussions between you and I, where I got to see and you taught me so much because I'm like, okay, I've got this band, I'm trying to do things. And you're like, you're looking over here, you need to look here and here as well. And, and the fact that you got so serious and you put in the hard work, you gave me information that enabled me to do some of the amazing things that I've been able to do. So when Mendoza joined the band, Mendoza was a roadie for us. Yeah. For the, the year before that. But he was always a great bass player. You know, he'd fill in for Kenny. He was great. But I'll never forget when I, I said to Mark, you're not into drugs and alcohol. He goes, I freaking hate drugs. I go, what? You're my guy. <laughs> People don't expect that to be the opening line. Right. The musician, they really don't. But it wasn't Twisted Sister, as you know. We were like notoriously straight man. And we just right. worked really, 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 really hard. So I know that there was a discussion coming up, and we should talk about this, about classic rock, right? Because yes. you one day talk to me about this. So why don't you just go fire away on this one? Okay? Well, you know, you put out this thing. It was about 60 seconds long. And you were almost trying to say like there was a limited life for classic rock. And I don't see it that way. Because I think one part of the equation that you might be missing now, and one of the things that really helped classic rock that you would not believe was a comedy movie. School of Rock with Jack Black. Because after that, all these schools started popping up with all these younger and younger kids who are going out and playing ACDC and playing Van Halen and playing like all these bands that are it. And where it used to be that like, you know, your daughter was like, well, this is mine. These kids today are taking this as their own, you know, and they're kids, they're high school kids, junior high, you know, like they're, they're loving it, they're getting it and it's theirs and they're playing it and they're singing it. And it's, it's to me, it's, the life for it is, you know, eternal. I don't see it. I don't see it dying out here. Well, I don't think anything dies. I mean, even disco has its niche. Doo-wop has its niche. I mean, I happen to love doo-wop. I love yeah. it. I just love the music. I mean, I play it all the time. My wife's not a fan of it. I love doo-wop music. Just, it's, that, it's a guilty pleasure for me, okay? Right. But everything has a niche. And my point of, first of all, I was interviewed for a movie called What is Classic Rock? That was okay. the whole point. I was interviewed for this movie, and I think the guy wanted some controversy, or he wanted something. I went, you know, I think classic rock is hard to define because it can, it's different things for different people, but if I had to think about, you know, like what Beatles song would be classic rock? Well, there's only a couple of Beatles songs that are really classic rock. The Beatles are a pop band, you know, so you will hear Helter Skelter, and you will hear Come Together. But, you know, in general, you don't hear I Want to Hold Your Hand, and She Loves You on classic rock, right. and yet they are the whole foundation of everything that we stand for, let's be honest. It wasn't for the Beatles, None of us would right. be doing any of this stuff. But classic rock doesn't play She Loves You. Classic rock doesn't play I Want to Hold Your Hand. Doesn't play Camp on Me Love. So classic rock has decided that maybe You Really Got Me by the Kinks is about as far back as you may go. Maybe. And I don't know if you play that or not. But maybe that's a passable classic. So what year does it begin? How far does it go? Does it end at Nirvana? Does it end at, you know, does it end at the grunge scene? Like, does it fill the spot? Now, with all of that, 
added, here's what else, and this is purely observational, but I believe this observation is true. The metal 80 period that we represent in yeah. America is nothing, but in Europe and South America, it's massive. That is unequivocally true. Yeah, without a doubt. Unequivocally true, Joe. Tomorrow, if, the, if COVID did not exist, there'd be 100 festivals in Europe this summer with White Snake, Judas Priest, blah, 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 blah. As long as you're alive, you can still do it. Packed, 100,000 people at home. South America, God knows. It's a religion down there. I mean, it's freaking religion. The kids are, and by the way, in Europe, the fans are maybe 18 to, to 60. Yeah. In South America, they're, they're 16 to 22. And they, it's like a religion. That's yeah. not in the United States. The U.S. is big. It's a lot of people. It can absorb a lot of things. But the pop culture is not rock and metal in the U.S. The pop culture is hip-hop, rap, female pop, country. That's the pop culture it doesn't mean yeah. that you don't have kids that wear led zeppelin t-shirts what it means though is the overarching pop culture is not the same that's all it is when right. you talk to guitar stores and you go do you selling it now and they tell you the guitar sales are, you know, now COVID has started a trend back but take COVID out guitars were in trouble the big music stores were in trouble people weren't buying amplifiers like we used to buy amplifiers like everything has changed it doesn't mean that bands like maroon five and alternate rock bands don't exist they do but the culture of pop in the u.s which means popular culture music listened to by the masses of teenagers out there is korean pop like k-pop and it's you know like crazy stuff like that that selena gomez and 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 Taylor Swift, and they're selling by the truckload. And you look at the yeah. rock fans, and they're just, it's minuscule compared to it. So I I don't get in this conversation to make an argument with someone. I go, it's numbers. It's absolutely numbers. BTS, that, that Korean pop band, yes, just aware. released their new single, Dynamite. First day streaming, 200 million hits on YouTube. Just one day, 200 million hits, okay? You look at... Um, Psy, uh, um, um, it's Gangnam Style, you know, four, uh, th 2.4 billion. But hits. already the stretch in years and that is big. Yeah, but my point being though is that it's not the new rock acts coming up, right? So there are some and it's small, but I'll yeah. give you an example of what happens in Europe that you would never see here in America. So we okay. did a thing called the Arrow Rock Festival in Holland a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And this is in one afternoon. So you pay 80 euros, 80 euros, which is, you know, $100. You, and this is what yeah. you get for the afternoon. You got Kansas, Ario Speedwagon, Motorhead, Whitesnake, Journey, Def Leppard, Twisted Sister, and Kiss in one afternoon. Yeah. In a giant field with like 70,000 people in it, two stages, every hour on the hour, Given an hour, all you're getting is the hits, right? Def Leppard, the hits, Journey, the hits. Think about that. You think that would happen in America, Joe? No. No. It wouldn't happen in America. No. Also, what happens in Europe? The governments of local countries pay for social events where the town council hires Twisted Sister to play on a stage in the town square. And they pay us because the government gives them cultural no. money doesn't exist in America. You imagine Poughkeepsie, Dio on the stage in Poughkeepsie? I don't think so. You know, Judas Priest in Butt Biscuit, Iowa in the middle of the town square? I don't think so. Happens in Europe all the time. Culturally, it's completely different. So when I make my comments, I talk about how America views this stuff. And yes, America accepts Twisted Sister and Motley Crue and Judas Priest and ACDC and Black Sabbath and White Sabbath, but they accept us in a very defined space marketed in a very defined way with defined radio stations which are not the mass culture stations they're specific stations if you think i'm wrong please argue me out of this well i'll take another time to argue with you because we are close to the hour mark okay See, I figured if i just kept talking you couldn't come back at me with any any numbers whatsoever you'd just like be out of it but you do understand what I'm saying. Though, right? I totally understand what you're saying. That's all. You know? Uh, but, you know, uh, 
like I said, we're close to the hour mark, so I kind of got to wrap this up here. <laughs> okay. But coming out next year, Twisted Business, the book. Yeah. And I imagine we're aiming for next year for the French Connection podcast. Um, I have my first production meeting next week, but I'm going to okay. Europe for a month to visit my granddaughter. So that kind of put everything on hold because my, my, my daughter, Samantha, had a, had a baby. And I, because of COVID, I couldn't get over. I'm going over for a month. So everything kind of like I Oh, great. Up. So uh, I will be going over there. So yeah, I, somewhere in December or January, I'll we'll start the French Connection. And you okay, will so definitely we'll... be on the show. Ah, all right. I look forward to it. And thank you. Well, I'll do this for you because I, I just, I'm going to do this. If you're inviting me on your show, I will let you pick whatever topic you want to pick that we'll talk about. Ah, okay. Okay. Very well. <laughs> we will talk about the guitar exhibit. After, All right. You know, we'll have a conversation now when I thought about it after because I really appreciate you giving me the space on that. That was fun. Uh, you know what? I had a great time just like I had a great time today. And I always appreciate when, you know, we get a chance to hang. So thank you very much. I was on my best behavior. You were. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, that looks like a good place to wrap it up, man. Okay. I Joe. appreciate it. It was fun. Thank you. Always a pleasure.